Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for doing the talk. And um, I think as soon as I can see the screen on YouTube, it's a weird delay of a couple of seconds. Um, I will just shut up and leave it to you. Um, so, and as always, if questions come up, please ask them in the chat and I will ask them uh, afterwards so you can have your uh, session. So, right. So I will shut up now, have fun, and I will mute myself. Enjoy. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Holger. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for joining. This talk, we're going to talk about fight complexity with functional programming. Myself, I'm Gopal Akshantala, and this is my Twitter handle and my website where I blog about uh, functional programming and other things. I am from India, Hyderabad, and uh, it's kind of 10.30 in the night, so it's kind of pretty fun to have a tech talk at this time. Let's move on. I'll start with a statement that one of uh, the managers made about functional programming. Uh, you know, FP is cool because it's complex enough to make devs feel like they're doing something smart. Uh, I see uh, managers kind of hate FP because they feel it kind of brings in complexity into the code base uh, if you kind of introduce it. Of course, it's not my manager and if he's watching it, he's great. <laughs> so, uh, but then today we're gonna see we're not gonna uh, learn FP just because it's cool. Of course, FP is cool, but we're gonna see how F FP is not complex. Instead, it fights complexity. And then that's, uh, we're gonna see that with a real world problem, not just uh, talking in the air. So, but then let's start with something uh, kind, of, uh, kind of, like I said, this is based on a true story that we have implemented in our team. And uh, that's kind of this code that I'm going to show today is actually running in production. And all those design discussions that I'm going to present today have really happened. And then let's start a session with something serious. Uh, all those developer holy wars that we keep having on our day-to-day -day basis as developers in our team. First one on the list, Mac versus Linux. You know, I intentionally uh, avoided uh, Windows here. All the Windows users, please excuse me. But then this is kind of war between uh, uh, the developers wherein people who use Linux feel they got a powerful system and Mac users just feel they got a stable system. But then both of them kind of have some cold war in between. And the next one, ID light theme versus dark theme. You know, this is kind of a new cool war that he, you know, but I see a lot of discussions on Twitter and stuff. I personally like like themes because they make me feel light. And then Eclipse versus IntelliJ, you know, this is kind of a really big war. Uh, at, because we are in a Kotlin talk, I think I can be biased uh, for IntelliJ. But Eclipse is great. You know, Eclipse is free. Eclipse is great. I'm going to use IntelliJ, of course, for today. But why am I saying all this? These are all some serious wars. But what about this? Oops, so it's a FP. How many of you actually got into this war uh, in your actual day-to-day uh, -day, you know, discussions or when you try to introduce FP in your team, kind of you got, a, you got people up opposing it. So today's talk, probably I wanna, I had a similar experience and I wanna show how you can actually show to the people the power of FP. As a developer, uh, as I've started learning FP, you know, this is the question that haunted me a lot. I kind of searched everywhere, read a lot of blogs, watched a lot of videos, but in the end, I could not, you know, draw a line between what is OOPS and what is FP. Probably there is a reason for that. You know, how do you define a paradigm? And uh, probably one way to define it is through all the principles uh, that are predominant in those paradigms. Say OOPS has all those solid principles that are uh, proposed by Uncle Bob and FP, uh, deals with all these other principles like immutability, differential transparency, side effects of the boundaries, et cetera. Uh, OOPS principles mostly talk about polymorphism, encapsulation, and other things. FP principles talk about uh, you know, how functions should be written, how they should be composed, and uh, how side effects shouldn't be done in pure functions, and how they should be put on the boundaries, et cetera. It basically imposes some discipline into coding. That said, I don't see any reason why they can't be used together. I don't see any principle that contradicts with any other principle in solid and oops or something. So it never is a either or. It always can be mixed together and used wherein, uh, when they're applicable, right? So, but that said, we can't uh, kind of discuss about all these principles today because of the limited time. 
but then this is what i thought uh, within the limited time what could i cover so should i kind of go and in, jump into definitions of what is immutability what is refreshing transparency what are first class functions etc but that's something you can find on a lot of blog posts or many many kind of tutorials are available online this is what i thought probably let me use this time to explain how if it actually made me productive how that uh, helped me being productive in my day to day programming and like i said we're going to take a real world problem not a dummy problem but a real world problem and solve it using fp principles and this problem is ubiquitous across a lot of services back end services especially and we're going to see that uh, in shortly that said uh, if you kind of have uh, experimented with if you're coming from java background kind of experimented with optionals or streams or even if in the kotlin if you have just written some code with sequences and other things you should be perfectly able to follow this start because there is nothing complex going on uh that said i'm going to say this particular phrase a lot of times please go back and refer because uh i want to cover as many topics as possible within limited time within the context of this problem and so the sudden things i just want to touch up and then want to uh, leave you with a pointer wherein you can go back and refer so that uh, it kind of gets clear and this is a demo driven talk i'm going to show you a lot of code uh, but don't feel stressed to understand the code right away while the talk is going on it's okay to be like this is being recorded and going to share the code and the slide deck so you can always go back and connect all the dots pretty easily just sit back and relax and let me guide you through what i'm trying to present awesome great so this is a totally language agnostic talk and these principles can also be applied in other languages like java or python or scala etc let's jump into the next war that we haven't talked about the style war imperative versus declarative and that guy in the middle is a jotlin developer who is a jotlin developer so a developer who has come from a java background and entered into kotlin pretty recently uh, i call him a jotlin developer because he kind of uh, he is used to a lot of imperative style in java and he suddenly gets into kotlin sees a lot of tool set functional tool set and it suddenly is confused what to use so these are two styles that he kind of uh, is not sure which one to take up let's see uh, let's kind of help that guy and see how we can uh, what kind of co- what kind of style actually suits what problem so let's start uh, with analogy with an analogy what is an imperative style so imagine you have a lot of puzzle pieces and then you have uh, the instruction set to fit all those pieces like a lego pieces so do this first do this next so imperative coding is like having all those pieces separately and the instruction set separately and then you give it to the computer uh, differently and then your computer actually fits your pieces together and runs them right uh, it doesn't matter for your computer whatever way you give it let's see that in an example so let's start with some team building activity uh, uh, because we are all isolated we need some excitement so uh, let's concatenate last names in a team with a delimiter so you'll, you'll get a list of names in a team and then this is the kind of string you got to come up with you got to take out the last names and concatenate them with a delimiter as simple as that so our jotlin developer comes up with this code so what it does it just takes in a list of uh, nullable strings and then it has a temporary output and then it kind of extracts last name based on the last white space in the particular name last white space as in uh, if you have uh, some uh, gopal akshantala so you would go with the last white space and then take out akshantala out of it so this thing works don't worry about it but this thing he has submitted that for code review so his senior developer right away sees and screams what about all the corner cases was so what kind of corner cases can this particular problem have because we are dealing with spaces you know a lot of a lot of uh, corner cases are there like for example names might be empty names can have trailing spaces names can have more than one space in a real world you never know and also he is a good guy he is dealing with nullables because he is coming in kotlin it's, had it been java he also had to deal with nulls so that said okay this guy goes back and kind of uh, kind of patches his code with lot of lot more ifelse conditions and kind of he deals with null team uh, great and then he deals with uh, white spaces he trims them and then he does nested ifelse checks and all that stuff so uh, then the senior developer sees that and again screams hey did we even test it 
because the moment he runs it he gets this kind of output where he has an extra delimiter in the end so this guy again starts thinking he kind of uh, sits and tries to debug what is going on and comes up with another patch you know he kind of has a flag now and then he try he tries to check what is the first and tries to avoid that uh, uh, delimiter for the first one and then etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, it's okay if you don't understand the code right away but what i'm trying to convey here is this code looks like a patched art form just like the horse that the uh, the popular agile horse you see on the right you know any form of art or writing the moment you patch up things it actually loses the meaning of what it tries to convey our particular code is totally lost in its details uh, the code logic is totally shadowed by a lot of details all right imagine this uh, particular jotlin developer is born in a different parallel universe as a declarative programmer how does he start so this is how he would start solving his problem so instead of uh, having a uh, having uh, started with this he starts with a stream or you can say a sequence uh, this is common for both java and kotlin and then uh, as he notices all these corner cases he goes back and adds these uh, uh, extra statements to actually get his problem statement done see how concise this declarative code you almost got you know four is to one compression ratio for our declarative code but how did he achieve that with declarative coding let's just see them side by side what is going on see this null check can be replaced with this nullable and by the way i don't recommend using a nullable type as a function parameter as i've done here this is only for the example sake in real world if ever you have to have this condition where you are exposing this as a nullable parameter have a different overloaded function which doesn't take this parameter all right so i used sequence and then if it's null i would give an empty sequence and all, none of these parameters would run great and then there is a nested if else check and that can be replaced by these three expressions the moment i'm saying expressions because there aren't statements they're expressing what they're doing and they're returning a value and then all this uh, you know kind of a uh, big patch junk can be replaced with these two beautiful statements that's all big do your job great so we have seen what is imperative code declarative code is like fitting all those pieces together yourself and then giving it to the computer to run right for the computer it doesn't matter it kind of uh, Uh, can run whatever you give but for a developer who is reading your code this makes a lot of difference it actually gives you a way to prepare a mental model in your mind before uh, before kind of debugging the code or trying to understand it while the imperative code you have to kind of map the instructions with what is in the code and kind of leaves you with a lot of cognitive load on on you that said java is like the Uh, lion king of programming languages we all agree you know it's been predominant it will be for few more years and kotlin has just came up it's like the scub but then kotlin has a lot of uh, functional tool set built in actually kotlin is pretty sneaky in terms of balancing both imperative and functional tool set so uh, great this is a modern language uh, why is this why are these modern languages running towards functional programming is it all just about style that we just see saw sequences are they just a replacement for for loops let's see uh, let's uh, try to see if that's just about style or is there any hidden philosophy let's put a wrinkle to a problem let's try to concatenate these names in parallel how can we do that see uh, i i can show you uh, the implementation that i've done with folk join pools and uh, uh, whatever uh, thread pools etc or core routines you may say if you have an imperative style that that is all that you have to got to do it kind of uh, again uh, we already are lost in details in our imperative implementation and using all those folk join pools etc would actually make our code more complicated the reason why our imperative style will suffer such a problem is we kind of have two things how to do and what to do and looping through the list and aggregating the results is how to do and then validating the names and extracting the last names are what to do the problem is in an imperative style we kind of mixed both and, and now that we have to change one of the how to do which is looping through the list in parallel we had to rewrite our entire algorithm 
Uh, if time permits, I can probably show you, but then in the code I'm gonna share, I have a parallel implementation of imperative style as well. Great, now what, what about our uh, declarative style? All you got to do is just change that sequence to a parallel stream, a parallel stream coming from JDK directly. That's all you got to do and some minor tweaks in between because uh, we are having some extinction functions on uh, Java stream. So the code structure looks almost similar. It, got, it doesn't, don't have to do anything else. See, uh, now with this, I wanna make a statement that this is not just about style. There's a hidden philosophy called the core context philosophy underneath this. What is core context philosophy? It's about having the core and context separate. You can label it as particular to FP, but uh, it's, a, it's a very good uh, function, uh, I mean, a software principle where you got to write to abstractions. Now that we have written to abstraction of stream, we can easily switch that stream with another stream with a different context and everything runs as we expect. So if the, the moment you separate core and context, the core logic from the context in which it runs, we can do different thing, things differently without doing different things. Awesome. So we're almost halfway through our talk. We kind of just touched basics of uh, and uh, trying to, because I'm, I'm hoping to address this talk to a basic audience with basic knowledge of functional programming. But now we're gonna jump into some, some more advanced topics, not in terms of uh, advanced as in advanced, but more than basic. So I kind of have an internal bank for you. The sequence or stream that we have been using till now is uh, Monad. So how many of you uh, heard about Monads before? Probably, uh, if you have heard about Monads before, you might have also heard about the curse it has got. So this guy, Douglas Crockford, once famously said, once you understand Monads, you lose the ability to explain them to others. Uh, that's kind of partially true, but I'm gonna kind of break the curse today. So by the way, this was me trying to read about all this functors, Monad applicatives in my initial days, kind of uh, going through all the sentences wherein they say, Monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors, you know, that sounded like a Harry Potter spell. I couldn't make out anything out of it. Uh, but then turns out, uh, this is not as scary as they're named after. It's just the names are intimidating. We're gonna see that today. By the way, I'm not gonna get into the details of what are functors, monads, applicatives. They're all three different things, but then I'm gonna just refer to them as monads for the convenience of this talk. If you wanna refer, uh, there's an excellent article written by this guy, and you can see this uh, uh, a link here. I'll be sharing the slide deck so you can go there or you can just Google it out. You would be able to make it out. Awesome. So uh, I'll be using this monad today. Let's start with the monad. Uh, there are of course a lot of monads as a part of Kotlin as well as JDK, like optional in JDK is one monad. And uh, today we're gonna use this monad called either. And Kotlin doesn't have it out of the box. So I'm gonna use this awesome library called Arrow. Arrow dot kt.io is where and you can find all the documentation for IO. It's an excellent library. I really recommend everyone to go and see that. That said, uh, what is an either monad? So if you see, uh, just let me start with a crash course of what is a monad with all these cartoons and comics, and then we'll jump into the code uh, uh, very shortly. So imagine monad exists in two states, a left state and the right state, as you can see, as I've written here. And on the left state, either contains some kind of failure, and on the right state, it contains a valid value. So that said, uh, let's see how we're gonna make use of this property of monad. By the way, monad is just a design pattern, uh, uh, if you ask me, and then it, it has to abide to some loss called monad loss, but we're not gonna jump into any of those today because we'll only focus on where do we use monads? What are the applications of monads rather than how to write a monad? Unless you're a library developer, uh, you don't have to write monads with your, your own hands. Mostly you can pick up a monad from a library or something from uh, the standard JDK itself. Great. So imagine uh, you have a plus three function and uh, all you have to, uh, and you want to actually apply that function on a value. Uh, traditionally, what you do is you call that function passing this value so that you get a value plus three in written. If you have this value inside a monad box like this, like if you have this two inside this box, so how you can actually do that plus three is you pass this plus three function 
to the map and then uh, the monad applies that function on this, which is here, and then puts the value back in the box. That's it, as simple as that. This is how I could achieve that using code. And this fold is something like a turn terminal operator wherein the moment you want to get the value out of the box, you use a fold and it takes in two functions. So the first function maps to the left value if it's in the left state, which means the right state that we have seen before. And the second one actually maps to the right state if it's in the blue state that we have seen before. So this particular function would give me five, great. So this same uh, philosophy applies to sequences that we have seen before, sequences of monad as well. So if you have to map uh, plus, plus three for each and every value, all I got to do is just uh, do a dot map and then pass this function. All right, so what happens if that is in the red state, uh, which I'm trying to do with, with either dot left. The moment I say either dot left, that's like I'm instantiating an instance of either which is on the left state. And then I'm gonna do a plus three on it uh, using a map. And then I'm gonna do a fold, which is a ternary, uh, terminal operator. So I get back nothing. I get back a unit because fold here for the left is doing nothing. Because this is in a left state, the function I have passed plus three is just ignored. That's a property of monad, which we're gonna to use today, which is important. I'm gonna show how that happens inside the code pretty soon. But for now, just uh, understand the concept on a, uh, on a external overview. So great, what if like in maths, we have f of g of h of x. Now let's say I have a nested function calls that I have to call upon on a particular value then if I have the value inside Monad, I can, I can do this. I can do a sequence of mapping. You know, this is called monadic composition. And what is the use of it? So you can actually pass down your box uh, uh, in a flow of functions, in a composition of functions, like I've, I could, you could see in the diagram here. And what happens if the box turns red in one of these functions, you know, and all the functions, subsequent functions in the composition just ignores that particular red box like we have seen before. That's short circuiting for us, which is pretty useful and which we're gonna use today, which is pretty important as well. Great. So we are done with the crash course on monads. And then we're gonna jump into the real world problem that I've, I've told before. Are monads used in enterprise software? Are they just for theory sake or are they really useful? Or do people really use them in applications? You know, to answer that question, uh, the product that we have built is the answer, wherein we kind of have, we are building a payments platform wherein we kind of uh, have integrations to various payment gateways. So we have a bunch of uh, requests, which I'm gonna explain uh, our requirements as well. So, our team kind of has a cult following with monads and because we there's a lot of brainstorming during our session whether to go with monads because that's not print kind of uh, implemented in our team. I work for Salesforce, of course. So we kind of had heavy brainstorming whether to take that route or not. And in the end, we kind of have taken it because that suits our problem. But of course, people are frustrated like this whenever someone says monad. So let's get, get into the requirements. We kind of, like I said, have an array of REST services. So they are pretty colloquial names like authorization, refund, capture, uh, void, et cetera. They're all payment related terms. And then they're, they're pretty uh, simple as I guess, show, you, show our REST payload. So you can try to make out what is going on. We kind of take amount field and payment gateway ID and all the card details, et cetera. So this is, uh, this kind of con gets converted into a POJO and that's our, uh, you know, unit of validation for today. But why is it complex? Let's see our requirements. Uh, imagine this is for one service and we kind of, I kind of simplified this for this uh, sake of this talk. So we kind of have some three kind of validations imagine. So we have simple data validations wherein we have an amount field let's say it's kind of an integer. So all we got to check is it's not negative or it's not kind of uh, above a billion dollar. And we have effectible validations. What I mean by effectful, we kind of might have to do a DB call or some effectful network call or something to actually validate it. 
like the account id for me to check this particular account id is valid or not i have to, have to do a db call and check if that is present in the db or not and then the nested validations so if you see this payment method it's like a nested object inside the parent object and this payment method is as is used in all the other services right so this nested validations also should be shared across various services i'll get into that so these find by the way these requests don't come in one they kind of come in batch so we have a list of these json objects so we got to build a batch validation framework for that so just for the sake of the stock uh, let's get away from this and then replace that with x just to be more playful and kind of not get too serious about the problem but then still understand the crux of it i'll be referring to x and when you when i mean x you can think of this json payload so the framework requirements so the first requirement is configure the order of validations now like i said we have various validations so as a validation developer i should be able to configure them like which validation comes first which comes next before because i want to put the least costly validation or cheapest validation at the start and then incrementally or ascending order i want to put the costliest one later so i should be able to configure them and i should be able to cross share common and nested validations like i said uh amount field is something that's common across all the all the fields uh, all the services and this payment method which i've shown before is a child object which is again common across almost all the services i should be able to share them without rewriting those validations and fail fast on each sub request this is pretty self explanatory and then partial failures that kind of is tricky imagine you have some uh, failures all these aliens are failures imagine so you got some failures in the validation layer and you send them to service layer and you do something you kind of have some exceptions etc and you have more failures in a batch in a bulk service or a batch service you can't straight away send an aggregated error response the moment you have a failure you got to keep and you have to wait till the end to see all the failures and then only send back an aggregated response in the end right that gets tricky you can't kind of when you have layers you can you can't save your failures in some temporary location until you process all the other ones you kind of kind of have to find a way to make these failures travel along with your valid ones till the last layer awesome so that's another problem or requirement that i've got and some meta requirements like uh, we almost got a century of validations Uh, had it been a five or ten validations, it doesn't matter. You don't need a design. You can almost write it in any way required. Uh, but you have uh, when you have a uh, hundred validations, kind of gets tricky to manage all of them. You need a design, and unit testability is a very important because a lot of corner cases we have for all these validations, and we don't want to compromise on any performance, of course. And just like a real world, you never call it agile if you got the requirements on day one itself. so we kind of started with one egg one validation so just like we never had bulk as we started a service so and we just had one or two validations life was pretty simple as you know and then uh, we introduced bulk we still have not many validation we just had one service so many eggs one validation life is still not so difficult but the moment we had more services and more validations and more eggs kind of it kind of burst out the problem went difficult we couldn't manage we couldn't uh, unit test a lot of things because i'll show you how the code ended up looking like i'm jumping into my ide uh, i'll have to swap it to desktop one can you guys see my uh, ide yep awesome uh, so is the second so uh, uh let me show you something uh before jump showing you the code so we are doing some operations as a part like i've discussed before we have some operations for each and every validation so imagine this is a simple operation which is done on a simple field like amount wherein all you need is a data validation uh, again this is a demo code uh, wherein i have simple code just trying to explain what's going on and then we have a throwable validation what a throwable operation Uh, what i mean is imagine this is doing some db call wherein it might throw an exception i'm using iwo from arrow uh, i would request you to go back and refer iwo what is it doing 
but for this uh, particular talk i don't want to go in depth and then it's not really required but if someone has question and we have time left i'll i'll be able to answer it and then uh, we have a nested so these two operations are uh, kind of running on eggs and the last one kind of imagine yolk is a nested object inside egg and kind of this is an operation done on yolk so with that background let's see how our code kind of ended up looking like uh if we had kind of extended our if else strategy same if else strategy that we have started before so this is how a code looks like it kind of i i don't have to explain it is difficult to manage and kind of grows and grows uh what i'm trying i'll just briefly explain what i'm trying what was going on and so i'm maintaining a bad egg failure bucket so the, uh, we have a lot of eggs now and then what we got to do is we got uh, the moment we validate them in the end i need valid ones and invalid ones so for that i'm maintaining a map wherein i put all the invalid ones and the ids for those invalid ones so that in the end i can filter stuff so for that i'm iterating and i'm calling these operations and then checking the results and then putting in the bucket as i receive validation errors it's okay if you don't understand like i said uh, you can go back and refer all you got to see is this kind of is complex because it has a lot of nested uh, nested uh, loops as try as well try uh, try catch expressions etc but let's not talk uh, objectively let's uh, i mean let's not talk subjectively let's get into some metrics i kind of uh, i'll show some metrics that i have calculated using sonarland uh i have used sona kotlin plugin that comes uh, by default with sonarland and then try to uh, calculate cognitive complexity so this is the tab where i'm in cognitive complexity and as you can see the imperative validation that i'm currently showing you as a cognitive complexity of 18 uh, this is again a dummy code uh, and i would uh, request you to imagine what we do in, in kind of production this cognitive complexity is of course uh, calculated by various parameters you can google around how this is being calculated but the metric number shows that uh, this is pretty difficult to comprehend as we read and then uh, okay because i'm doing everything in one function that may be the reason what if i break this into various functions can i can i get an improvement okay let's see so i have broken down all those operations that i've shown before into different functions so now the validate one does simple operation and validate two does throwable operation etc i you got the point i hope so i've kind of divided them into various function this is great good better uh, but then there is this guy who kind of orchestrates all these function calls right uh, somebody has to call these functions and get the results back and then maintain this global bad egg failure uh, bucket whatever and then kind of have to put these ids and all that stuff this guy as you can see is doing a lot of uh, <clears throat> calls to a lot of validations and getting back the results doing a lot of orchestration he is killing the single responsibility principle and uh, kind of in the end uh, imagine if i have to introduce more validations or shuffle the order of validations it kind of is a code change and the biggest pain is you have to update all the tests and then it's pretty scary to do such a code change on especially end of releases of friday evenings right so what i'm looking at is okay in this code we have mixed our how to do with what to do the same problem that we have seen before is there a way that i could abstract out the orchestration of validations and then put the validation separately that way i think i can achieve a better code with lesser cognitive load and easily extendable that's what we're going to do today but for now let's just enjoy the chaotic code right i love playing this game mario this is called uh, devils level or something uh, i don't remember but then this is a fan made level so this is how debugging a code like this looks like feels like you know you kind of have to escape through a lot of uh, back and forth statements awesome <laughs> so let's try to implement chain of responsibility you must have all heard about this 
pattern this is a very popular pattern when it comes to validations in uh, oops at least uh, if you are familiar to that but then let's see how we can implement the same pattern with functional programming today but before that is fp uh, best fit to do to solve this problem of course this is a functional programming talk what else you expect me to say i can't say is oops the best fit right i, I take take you till this moment and then say no fp is not the best fit okay uh, i think it's a bad joke but then if is the best fit because uh, the moment you see a lot of transformations uh, or let me say it this way there's always uh, scenarios wherein you call uh, functions on an object or uh, there is another scenario wherein uh, you kind of pass objects to functions and functions kind of process those objects now we have a second scenario wherein all these validations are processing our eggs right so that is where fp actually shines if we shines wherein there are a lot of transformations like a to b b to c c to d etc and that's the reason this is more popular in big data uh, and other popular streams that which which rely more on computation or transformations etc so we have a similar situation so fp fits our problem the best what was the problem uh, and how did we uh, kind of what mistake did we do this is a 2d problem uh, if you see there are validations there are eggs the problem is uh, we didn't treat validations as values we just treated them as functions the moment you see functions are values as well you kind of get a different perspective to the problem so treating functions as values is something called first class functions which you uh, which in kotlin we have it we in have it in java as well so and then let's see what i'm trying to do in the code what i mean by that so now my validate function that i've shown before i can split screen and compare as well mm. so this was our imperative code and these are the validations before and these are our validations now so we kind of uh, have validations as values as you can see these are just vals and i am using lambdas to represent them now they have become values now that's how i what i mean by functions as values and then we going to make an extensible framework where there are three parts uh, this is again comes to separating out what to do from how to do now we want to have validation separately and the configuration what i mean by configuration what runs after what the composition of the validations and then the execution the strategy in which you want to run these validations be it fail fast or uh, accumulate all the errors or whatever you want to have these three separate and then that makes your uh, kind of framework extensible we'll see how that can be done the first thing i would do is make all my eggs immutable this is of course not a requirement for our design but the moment i make something immutable i kind of happily sleep after i've coded that because i'm sure none of the code that i've passed into has changed my state that's a big boost for, for especially while you are debugging that kind of saves you a lot of cognitive load and time great second uh, the problem we have uh, so now i'm talking about having again coming back to a problem we are passing all the eggs and in the end i want a list of eggs good eggs and bad eggs but i don't care about bad eggs i care why the eggs are bad what i mean is i care about validation failures so there are two data types right eggs and validation failures they can't coexist in a list the kotlin or java they prohibit it so what we going to do we going to wrap these guys into monad boxes the either monad that we have seen before so we going to put all these eggs into monad boxes and then pass to our validations and then our validations would actually split them into two different states now i hope you understand what why i have used that state so the in the end i would get all these monads of course but few of them would be in left state and few of them would be in right state and that's how i kind of segregate between good ones and bad ones awesome so now that we kind of have these monads let's standardize our validations uh, i'll show what i mean so let's make our all our validations speak a monad language so in this particular validation i have this type and this is a custom type i have type alias that i have to find let me go in here and show what it exactly means so this guy 
this is a function which takes in a nether monad and then spits out a nether monad so that's what i mean by standardizing validations or making all the validations speak the monad language so the moment i get a error here so this is a simple validation wherein i kind of uh, we have seen those compositions before and there is a big bunch of api that you can a lot of operations that you can uh, do on like filter or else is one wherein uh, which filters based on this result of simple operation similarly validate two uh, which is kind of has a try catch i'll again have a split screen and show how it exactly uh, looks like in imperative code so you can kind of correlate so this is validate two it kind of has a try catch if else etc so this has a depth of uh, two you can say now that i made it linear uh, now i don't have a depth so i kind of used flat map and other apis so that it kind of became linear how come i, I was able to do that because now i don't care whether my uh, my monad with the either that i'm getting as a parameter inside of a function is in left state or right state i kind of write my code if it's left of course monad would take care of kind of ignoring all the all the functions all these functions but if it's right state monad would apply all these functions but how is it happening here let's get into the code and see uh, uh i'm kind of uh, i'm in the flat map method of the either uh either class in v, uh, in sorry in uh, arrow library where you can see the simple code where it says if it's in right state apply the f f that i have passed if not just send back whatever is invalid that's kind of uh, the trick behind which takes care of uh, you know keeping all that cognitive complexity under the bed so that you as a developer can write linear programs with that said let's get this is uh, i have already shown you on the id what is the difference how we kind of uh, migrated one function to another this is uh, the imperative and this declarative one and then let's get back to your framework how to do so all these requirements are how to do that we have uh, discussed before now configure the order of validations now we have all these validations as functions how can we configure what comes first and what comes next all we need is just a list an ordered list that is all we need right uh, we just have to put our validations one after the other okay uh, this is not as simple as that at times you can have kind of we discussed about parent and child validations i'll be getting there uh, but for now this is how i can achieve configure of validations next comes cross share common and nested validations okay <clears throat> so this chain validations as i told before they all run on the yoke as you can see they take in a yoke and then they give a validation failure yoke as i said imagine it's a nested object inside egg okay so these are chain validations and we have two kind of two different types of validations when i say different types there are of different data types what i mean by that see if you see this is validation validator of immutable egg and validation failure while this is of yolk and validation failure they are of two different types and then i i happily have them in two different uh, lists but how would i merge them together now i want uh, the child validations to be run along with the parent validations and i want to have these child validations to be running in a different service as well but the problem is i can't merge these two lists because there are two different types so what we do is we do lifting that's that's a kind of uh, a term in functional programming language functional programming paradigm wherein if you are converting one function type to another it's called lifting i'm going to briefly show you what's going on if you feel it complex again if you look back to the code it kind of makes sense all i'm trying to do is take a list of child validations you can see the type is child to failure t and then i'm going to return a list of parent validations and how am i going to how am i doing it inside i am uh, again this calls this lift uh, for each and every inside this as you can see this is a core logic wherein i actually apply that uh, apply the child val i i one more thing i kind of also send a mapper 
a mapper which says how to extract your child out of parent. I know it's kind of is a bit complex, but kind of just relax and listen to me. And then if you go back, it all makes sense. I keep saying it again and again because I personally feel stressful when I see a lot of code while a talk is going on. Also, okay, so uh, you take a you take you take two parameters, especially forget these two; they're not important. So you take a list of child validation, and you can map or map or which says how you can extract a child out of parent. For example, in terms of uh, I'll show what I have used. Okay, this is a mapper. So in our case. Uh, we get to say that, hey, this is how you can plug, you can take a yoke out of uh, immutable leg because I, I'm a generic function, I don't know that. So I've told you that. So what you have done inside the operation is you have taken a child out and then you applied a child validation on it. And none of this is being executed. This is a function. I'm returning a function, as you can see here. This is a function, this is a fun type function. So what I'm essentially doing is I'm taking a function, I'm taking a mapper, and I'm returning another function, which is of the type of parent. So that way, I can happily concatenate all these child validations. Uh, as you can see, this is parent validations, and I'm concatenating all these child validations along with it. That's how I can kind of lift those, uh, like, as we discussed. Uh, so, yep. We have seen this, how we are done the lifting and then fail fast on each sub request. Okay, so that, uh, how can we fail fast on each sub request? Now we got, like a, like we discussed, we have a pretty problem. We got validations, we have eggs. How can we, how can we manage both? That's a 2D problem, like I said. All we got to do is just have a for loop, right? A nested for loop. So I have a for loop of all validations, and then I have a for loop of uh, each and every each and every egg. And all I'm gonna do here, so it is. So and then all I'm gonna uh, this is validatables by the way. What I mean by validatables is eggs here, and this is of validations. And all, all I'm gonna do is just apply one after the other, and then check if it's in the left state or right state. Okay. Uh, again, uh, I hope it made sense for you. Just don't kind of go deep into the code. That said, uh, how does it look like? We kind of built a good infrastructure, but in the end, we're again going back to our imperative habits. We can do better than that. I can show something like this. So in here, I'm using a operator called fold. It might not be familiar, but this comes out of the box in Kotlin. So fold does uh, something similar. It does an aggregation operation. I request you to go back and read about this API. But the reason why I'm using this fold is it kind of, uh, you know, this for loop, nested for loop, no matter how many times you see it, you uh, new nested for loop is again a new nested for loop. You kind of have to spend time debugging what's going on in there. But the moment you understand what a fold is, that's a shared vocabulary. You don't have to kind of uh, go into the code and see what's going on. Plus, a fold is coming straight away from the library. You don't have to unit test this stuff. It kind of is tested by Kotlin developers itself. So it comes for free, tested and free. And then, like I said, within your team, uh, the code reviewer doesn't have to really break his head what is going on once you understand. We can exchange uh, vocabulary in terms of this is just like design patterns, uh, again, a shared vocabulary. And there are a lot of such uh, operations that we can use on a day-to-day -day basis. These are like a dozen FP operations uh, that you can use some more, but then you can get away with these dozen FP operations on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I request you to go back and read APIs for all these. These are all coming right from Kotlin out of the box. And they're super awesome. And the reason when the moment you use these operations, your code kind of gets concise and high quality because they're all tested by the library developers or the language developers. Awesome. Uh, the partial failures. I'm not going to go deep into how we are achieving partial failures in here. Uh, all I can say is now that in the end, we kind of uh, uh, show what I've done in the test. I've kind of written a unit test for this. 
uh, so uh, imagine this is a unit test wherein I have a sequence of uh, eggs and then I'm getting a fail fast strategy. And then in the end, I got all the validation results. So the validation results are nothing but a bag of valids and invalids. Uh, as you can see the type here, it's list of either, either bonads. So I have a bag of left and right. So I can take this back and send it to any layer and the layer would be easily be able to segregate between lefts and rights and then uh, only process the left ones or the right ones. And that layer as well is following functional principles. It doesn't have to do anything kind of, it can directly write functions on it. And then as we've just seen before, any function applied on left state either would be ignored and right would be kind of, uh, would be executed. So that's how we can uh, address this partial failures problem. And what about scalability? You know, you can't kind of get away without a matrix meme in a tech talk. So we have seen a fail fast strategy. Now that our strategy is different, it's out of uh, like, we have validations, we have configuration, and this is the third part, the strategy part. And I can write the strategy the way I want. Now I have another flavor of get fail fast here, uh, which I would request you to refer as I've shared the code. And then I have an error accumulation strategy and a different flavor of error accumulation strategy. And then I have a strategy to run everything in parallel. How that is done? All that I have to do is this. Uh, <clears throat> based on the size, let's say our eggs are like about 10,000. I want to run things in parallel. And we have seen a how we can do that before using just a parallel stream. Here, uh, I am using a sequence for a serial stream. But if I really want to have a switch the moment I have like uh, more eggs, based on the size of the eggs, I can kind of use a parallel stream or stream, and then everything runs in parallel without changing any code and validations as well as configuration. It's just the executor's job to run everything in parallel, right? And what about complexity? This is the title of the talk, right? So I kind of pre-computed complexity uh, because to save time. So this is how the complexity looks like. This railway validation is the one that I've shown before. It's literally zero. Can you believe that? Why is it zero? Because the programs, every function is linear. There is no branching. All the branching is taken care by the monad in the background and you've got linear programs. Of course, this is a demo talk, like I said, that's why it's kind of zero, but then it, you might have a little number, but when it, and moreover, I have a lot more functions compared to what I have an imperative. So like I said, the number would be, when you compare imperative and uh, declarative or whatever, whatever implementation that I've seen before, the, the margin or the difference would be huge. And even as a developer, as you read the code, uh, it's pretty simple as you're, if you get actually uh, well-versed with the monads and whatever we have discussed today, it kind of really gets easy to read them as well as debug them. So with this, I wanna make a statement that SP is not complex, but it fights accidental complexity. Great, we got, uh, uh, we of course haven't compromised on performance as well, like I said, and all our validations are unit testable. Plus, let's say if we have, uh, uh, let me go back to my code. Okay, I have shown simple linear validations, but validations can go crazy, wherein you have a parent which has multiple children, as well you have a child which has multiple parents, like I have all these uh, scenarios tested in this code, it kind of get becomes a graph algorithm. But the good news is uh, you can manage all of that in the config. You can kind of do whatever graph algorithms you have, whatever cycle detection and et cetera, et cetera, and come up with a chain in the end in the configuration. And then the executor of course doesn't care. You just have to provide it a chain and it just executes one after the other. So, that's, that's the greatest part of this design. So it's pretty extensible to whatever, whichever way your validation, uh, whichever structure your validation have got. And the reason why I used railway is this particular program paradigm is popular known as railway oriented programming, popularized or coined by this guy, Scott Plashen. 
I request you to Google this. Uh, you would find a great talk by this guy, Scott Plashen himself using F sharp, but most of those principles can be applied to any language. So with that, we kind of converted our chaotic code into more linear and more kind of uh, think, uh, more understandable or reason, easy to reason about linear railway oriented code. And these are the code uh, links that you can find uh, all the code here. If you like them, please put a star to them. Uh, I know I'm sounding like an Uber driver, but those stars really matter. <laughs> so I just wanna end up uh, with this statement. There is something called a blob paradox, uh, which wherein a uh, programmer who knows the best language would know all, uh, all the pluses and minuses of the language that are lesser uh, powerful than his, the language he knows. Of course, he can't identify the same with uh, languages which are more powerful. So, but in the end, what I mean to say is, as a programmer, you got to know uh, you got to know where to use, when to use, what style. You know, sometimes uh, you can't go with declarative style. Imperative is more simple to understand. But then, how would you know when to use what? A simple answer is to master both. Uh, the moment you master both, you would know when to use what. There is no one answer to it. And this particular figure doesn't say that functional programming is superior to object-oriented programming. What it tries to convey is knowing functional programming makes you a superior developer compared to a developer who just knows object-oriented programming. So that way, uh, I request feedback from all of you guys. I'm almost done with my talk. Uh, this is my personal idea. I would love if you write to me. And we kind of won the fight over complexity, skadoosh. Great, uh, I, I would be happy to address any questions if you guys got. So let me get this unmuted, right. So um, I kept an eye on the chat box. Um, I think a lot of people are already sleeping at home or binge watching Netflix. So we have uh, not that many watches yet. But anyways, I can't spot any questions and I wouldn't mind having a couple of more minutes. So you teased us a bit about the IO thingy you used oh, in one yeah. of your code examples. Um, so if you don't mind, why, why not just talking a bit about this one? Awesome. Yeah, sure. I would love to talk. So <clears throat> IO, like I said, comes from uh, Arrow and IO actually makes, uh, helps you abstract out all the effectful operations that you do. What I mean is uh, this particular guy doesn't do anything unless you call this attempt. So what it does is uh, the moment you call this attempt, it converts all your effectful code to something uh, into an either. So th there's a lot of depth to IO. I mean, it can't be covered in one simple talk, but on a, on a overview, on a 30 feet, overview, all it does is it uh, it kind of imagine it as kind of a quarantine container where wherein you can do all your side effects and then pass it on to something else. And then the in the edge, you can kind of pass it to the till the edge of your function, or edge of your application. And then you can kind of uh, run an attempt or you can kind of directly run an uh, unsafe async. Unsafe run async. Uh, so as a as a uh, type, uh, I mean as a function name says, it's kind of unsafe, and that's something only you have to do at the edge of your program, wherein it then does it then fires all these DB calls, all your side effects, and then uh, runs it. So that's briefly about Ivo, but it's uh, so much powerful. And then, like I said, this is lazy again. Uh, that's a that's a term you should be using, wherein it defers all your validations till the end. And you can read it say API. It's also used along with core routines and a lot of stuff that goes in Arrow. I really, really recommend you to go there and read. Cool. And we got two questions. Uh, I won't. Oh, okay, I do. Uh, I try to to say his name, but I apologize up front. Uh, Zubi Pandey asks, can you uh, or says this thing goes above my head? Can you recommend any resources to get started in functional programming? Great. <laughs> yes, uh, we all uh, were there. Uh, so to start, like we actually started at the basic level wherein I converted an imperative code to functional code. 
i recommend you do that yourself uh, probably try uh, in a id and then try running it and then try experimenting those operations uh, you know knowing style is the first step to knowing a paradigm so get used to the style how how can you use lambdas and other things and then you can jump on to understanding what is the crux of functional programming uh, if you ask me in a simple sentence i would say functional programming is just like maths you do it like equations uh, so as a as a kind of more than a basic functional programmer i could see wherever i see functions i see equations uh, it takes in a input and then gives an output so it maps from input to output and then you can do some magical composition if you understand that way if think through uh, uh, you about your programs in that way so like i said start with understanding the style start with uh, experimenting with various lambdas and then uh, i'm going to share this code base just try to debug this or add your own code uh, at your uh, pace and then try to experiment that's how i learned for, uh, like i have learned reading others code as well as writing try, trying to change their code into something i would like to and then that's how it just it doesn't take a lot of time it kind of takes few months that's it hope i answered your question sounds sounds good and the uh yeah 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 sorry uh, he asked for the resources as well so i would uh, there are also many books like uh, one book i can recommend scott blashin uh, domain modeling done uh, made functional is one great book you should start reading wherein you would uh, find an awesome reason why you should go with functional programming yeah yeah we can go to the next question cool um if you could we should have a chat afterwards uh, we try to put the uh, the book into the the notes in here or the description in here so you have a link on there right uh, there is another Great. question which is from christoph uh christoph fry he asked is there any beginner monad implementation that works without arrow yes uh uh i can point you to a resource i totally forgot his name wherein he actually explains how to write a monad with your own hands uh, once you do it you kind of gets very uh, comfortable in trying to un- trying to understand what monads are uh, i'll probably ask you to do this uh, what i personally did is uh, you can go to the optional source code within your jdk and see how optional it is implemented optional is a monad is the simplest monad you can start with it's a it's called a maybe monad and then you would see how this if else condition if else uh, abstraction is done within the optional you can try implementing that with your own hands and then uh, uh, kind of come up with the role implementation that way you would understand monads but that said uh, i would recommend you to focus on uh, using monads rather than writing monads uh, so for using monads uh, already kotlin has nullable types which kind of replace optionals in java so nullables uh, if you just google kotlin uh, nullables versus optional you would find a lot of uh, good blog posts and that's first step to actually uh, get a, a feel of monad and then you can go about uh, uh, kind of doing a lot of operations on sequences like this filter filter not null etc cetera, etc cetera, wherein you would understand uh, what exactly a monad does mm. yeah if you want to go deep i have already given a link about functors monad applicatives that's awesome stuff and once you kind of get a taste of it go there uh, because it kind of uh, is a bit advanced but then it's an awesome uh, juice for your brain once you understand it cool so sorry i was still muted um i think that's it for today thank you so much um we, we can even let you go before midnight I'm so, thank you so much for joining us that late um it was great uh also uh, pro geeks already said like uh he has to leave early but um you made him hungry for more functional programming so really really great talk thanks for that uh we hopefully have you back soon and have a great night sure thanks for the opportunity holger and thanks this virtual kug uh, i would really <laughs> love to come back again i would love to hear a lot of feedback from you guys thanks a lot and good day good night for me <laughs> good night folks <laughs>